Therefore, we should also love and trust, there it is, in him and gladly do what he commands. So there's bookends. That's the first table, all to do with uh, obeying and honoring God. The second table has to do with the neighbor. All right. Back to the liturgy. Oops, wrong book. And I believe we were talking about readings. We've gotten as far as the, the free readings, that is the Old Testament, the Epistle, and then the Gospel. You've got your hymnal. We are now on page 11. And a little known fact here, which hopefully you know by now, is that the hallelujahs are not sung simply as an in-between type thing, or not as a thing after the second reading, so much as a thing before the gospel. We are rising and preparing for Christ, as it were, to enter the room, because we are about to hear his own very words in the gospel. So we stand and sing hallelujahs as if acknowledging as to acknowledge he is coming into the room right now. Stand up. And of course, I think here it's helpful and it's helpful in churches where they have gospel books, which we have we have a gospel book, which also uh, um, serves to highlight the importance of this reading. So you are now at the top of the first hill. And then there will be a second hill up here when we get to the very top, which is the Holy Sacrament. But we are at the, the Misa, the top of the first hill, and that is the Gospel and the Sermon. We have prepared all along up to this point for this, for this point. So, to highlight that, the Gospel book is carried from the altar. And everybody, while everybody's singing hallelujahs, it is placed into the hands of the subdeacon. And while the people are singing the hallelujahs, uh, the preacher or the reader actually should be the deacon. But if we don't have a deacon, then I read it myself. Uh, meanwhile, praise. The Lord be on my heart, on my heart and in my lips, when I show forth the praises of God. And then making the sign of the cross both on myself three times and on the first word of the gospel. And then comes the reading of it itself. And it might interest you to know that in Luther's day, the gospel was always sung. Now I chanted here, I think twice a year, Christmas and for Easter. Every so often I consider doing it for every Sunday. Um, but uh, that might be a bridge too far. I, don't know. I can do it, but the, the thing that's neat about it, that's, that's helpful about it, is that when the gospel is chanted, the tones used for the chanting of the gospel, in fact, I think the epistles were also chanted in those days, but the gospel tones were the same tones as you can recognize if you're at all musically inclined with the words of the institution. And so it creates a sort of link, a musical link between them. And then, of course, my hands are like this to frame the book, or like this, I mean, do it like this. Uh, the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter, and then comes the cross, signing. And in fact, you can do the same thing if you want. I mean, this is a rubric you could follow. Um, the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter, and then people sing, Glory be to thee, O Lord. And you can, if you want, when you see me doing it, you can also make the three signs the one on your forehead, may he be in my mind, may he be in my lips, and may he be in my heart. And then the reading of the Gospel. I mean, these things are all intended to help us recognize that this is really important. And so we rivet our attention. Now we had a little bit of what I call holy noise in church today. You might have noticed, right? And you got a little one in there. He's picking up a little storm. 
That's called holy noise. <laughs> Baptized child of God. You know? So you, you got to filter that all out. You've got to filter everything out. You know, somebody's having a heart attack over here. Somebody's dying over here. Whatever's happening, you've got to filter that all out. You're riveted on the words of our Lord, which are more important than anything. So you're standing. That's why you're standing for that. You were not standing for the first two readings. Now you are. So you're, you're riveted on that. And the words are the words are spoken. And uh, this is also why uh, those who read the gospel should not read it as though they've gone to an interpretive speaking school. I'll give you an example. I'm going to check on Jim Oh. Yeah. So, um, this is how you should not read the gospel. Do today's gospel. Right. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed. You shouldn't do that. Because that's what actors in a play are taught to do. They're taught to make the words come alive. Like you're reading Hamlet or something. This is not a play. So the reader of the gospel is a herald. You know, he's, he's an angel. Actually, the term angel means messenger. If you look in the second chapter of the book of Revelation, you find an interesting thing there. And that, if anything, is distracting. When a pastor does that, I just really got to focus then because get out of the way. Take a look at Revelation chapter 2. There are seven churches. And you will note that each church has an angel. Revelation 2 verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? And he says what to write, right? Then unto the angel, verse 8, of the church in Smyrna, verse 12, unto the angel of the church in Pergamos, and so forth. The angels of the churches are the messengers, they are the pastors who are to lead their churches. So the term angel is there used because the pastor is a messenger. So, he's reading the gospel, and by the way, this is another reason... I think it's helpful, as we do in this church, to have somebody else with equal heraldic, is that a word? Heraldic sense read the first two readings. And there is a rule, there should be a rule that governs every church. And if it's not in place, I think that church needs a quick education. The gospel is never to be read by an unordained man. The gift that is given, one of the appointments or gifts that is given to a deacon at his ordination is a gospel book. It is his job, before any other thing, to read the Holy Gospel. Maybe you know what the job of the, the most important job of the subdeacon is and what he is given as his appointment when he is appointed. You know what it is? Steve knows. It's a fly swatter. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the bugs away from the Holy Sacrament. That's his job. And the pastor is distributing the, the subject and watching the elements. All right, so comes the reading, and the reading is being done. The pastor looks, and all, here's another thing. The deacon or the pastor, will his eyes should never leave the page when he's reading. That's another mistake they often make. They go, you know, be ye merciful, as your father also is merciful. <laughs> Judge. 
pay attention. You're reading a holy book. Same goes for the deep subject. Your eyes never leave the page at this point because you want it made clear that every word is what you see on the sacred on the sacred page. So when you're done, when the pastor's done, then he looks up. Now the deacon says the word of the Lord, and we all say thanks be to God. The pastor says he sings the gospel of the Lord. Everybody sings praise be to the old Christ. And then during that. During that response, the pastor is praying another secret. A secret meaning a private prayer. Um, what if it's hard for me to do this offhand? But, um, uh, the words, uh, the words of the gospel keep my heart and mind. I can't remember the word. What the secret is? <laughs> Well, there's one before and after, and they can't do it if I'm not in the Senate. Yeah. But anyway, then the Gospel book is returned to the altar, and immediately, the first opportunity that there is, comes what next? The creed, the confession of the creed. And there's a reason for that. I'm going to guess what the reason is. I believe in God, one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. That connection, that link, is very tight. Gospel, creed, immediately after the gospel. It says something. It says, we confess this faith because we got it from the Word of God. So there's like, it's like showing where our confession of faith comes from. We've heard the word, we confess the word, because we, we acknowledge thereby that the word of God gives us what God wants us to know and also gives us the faith to believe it. It all comes riding on the power of the word. So as soon as you've heard the word, you confess it. Now in some churches, in some boards versions of the liturgy, I think in uh, the Lutheran service book has I think five different settings. And I don't know, I'm not as familiar with them as I am with TLA because we never use it, but you know, one or two of those settings, the creed actually comes after the sermon. Which isn't all bad. Because what you're saying then is that the word of God that we have heard preached. We have gladly heard and learned, like the fourth commandment says, and we confess it. Uh, so the creed comes immediately, and it's like you can't wait to say it. Now, if you notice on Wednesday nights, no creed. What's that? It's a weekday mass. It's a simpler mass. What we do for those, and this is has long precedent. We don't have all the bells and whistles, so to speak, of the high, the high mass on Sunday. This isn't really a high mass, because we don't have the incense. We don't have the bells in the right, but we do have bells, the church bells. Um, but there are some ingredients that you see and experience on Sunday mornings that you do not get on a Wednesday night. And the creed is one, except if the Wednesday night, like this past one, is a high, high day. We observed the nativity of St. John the Baptist. We sung the Mass, as you probably noticed if you were there, and we said the creed. And what that does is, is it accentuates or highlights the importance of this feast in particular. And of course, every Sunday is a big deal. Why? Why is every Sunday a big deal? It's the day of the resurrection. So every Sunday is an Easter. Not only that when the year goes on, but every single Sunday we are celebrating the Easter. That's, that's why if you count the 40 days of Lent, you actually come up with 46. Because you don't count the Sundays. Sundays don't count when you're counting those days. So, the Gospel having been read, the Creed having been said, 
Okay, now stick in another hymn. I don't think they do in the Church of Rome. This is a Lutheran uh, edition, the edition of hymns. It kind of is an, ex an extension of the gospel and the creed, and also weaves us right into the sermon. This is called the hymn of the day. Now, some churches call it a sermon hymn. I think it's better to call it the hymn of the day. And if you don't have a high feast during the week, you can also think of it as the hymn of the week. This is your big deal. This is your big hymn, the hymn of the day. So, we sing that. And then we're ready, finally, for the gospel. I mean, for the sermon. Which also takes us back to the third commandment. Take a look at that again. We just said this, right? Third commandment, page three in the book. So it's kind of fascinating, actually. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy? Interestingly, there's nothing about a day of the week in the explanation. Nothing at all. And Luther explains that that's because this was given to the Jews, particularly with regard to their feasts and festivals that were all in anticipation of the coming of Christ. Now that Christ has come, the meaning of the commandment goes through a little change because uh, as you're looking toward, let's see, let me do it this way. When you're looking toward the coming of Christ as a timeline, you're looking ahead with all the festivals and the new moons, as Peter talks about, and the feast days and the Sabbath day. Then he says, Don't let anyone judge you. This is an With respect to these things, because they are, they are shadows of things to come, but the body substance is of Christ. So when Christ comes, the way in which we keep the third commandment is a little different. What do we do? We do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and hear. Now, I'd like to say a word or two about preaching. Preaching of the gospel, I am firmly convinced, is a New Testament phenomenon. It came with the coming of Christ. And the reason for this is that I think the Bible bears this out. Take a look at Matthew chapter 4. multitude, he went up in the mountain, when his, the set, his disciples came unto him, now verse 2, and he opened his mouth and taught them. That is not redundant. Of course you open your mouth when you have to speak, right? Why does the Holy Ghost tell us this? He opened his mouth and taught them. This is the opening of God's mouth and teaching for the first time. Matter of fact, if you look at chapter 4, verse 17, you might ask, well, how can you say that's the first time he did? Look what, look what it says in chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, in response to that, I would say, this is a device which we often see in the scriptures where the overall theme of what is coming is given. And then it's fleshed out. So in other words, chapter 4, verse 17 is like the chapter heading. Jesus began to preach. And then in chapter 5, and here's what he said. Which means that his first sermon 
The Sermon on the Mount was where we get this note, he opened his mouth. Take a look at Acts, book of Acts. Chapter it says Peter opened his mouth. Got it? Well, I'm looking. Um, that's why I'm not paying. Oh. You got it? Yeah, that's in chapter 2, verse 14. I'm not seeing it there. Yeah, but there's one place where it's interesting where Peter actually it says he opened his mouth. That by. That's a very significant thing. When Peter and the apostles began to preach, it says they opened their mouths. It's almost like a technical term. Um, in fact, look at the um, chapter 2. When Peter explains to the multitudes which are complaining about these guys speaking in tongues, he says, this is what was spoken by Joel the prophet. Uh, that's in verse um, 16. 16. And among these things, you will read... Uh, Verse 18, and on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Do they have female preachers? No. Any more than there were female priests. But it does mean that the confession of the faith begins with the New Testament, and the sermon begins with the New Testament as a New Testament phenomenon. Now look, if you would, at the Psalms. Psalm 40. Did you find it? No, no. Does it find out what it says? My mouth is too Well, that's true. Open on my lips. But that's a little bit. That's, yeah, I guess that you could say that that's fulfilled in the New Testament. Chapter 40, Psalm 40, verse 7, is very clearly prophetic. Back to the foot of verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Not going to do the job. Then said I, Lo, I come. That's Jesus talking, right? In the volume of the book, it is written of me. That means the Bible's about Jesus. The book is written about me, he says. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. That's not David boasting that is Jesus proclaiming who he is. Now look at verse 9. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. And that is fulfilled in Matthew chapter 5. He opened his mouth. 
So also look at the gospel at the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 4. Verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, and he glorified of all. Now that's so far that's an Old Testament thing. The teaching of the rabbis was not uncommon. He was a rabbi, he was teaching. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, notice that, he's a rabbi, he's doing a rabbi thing. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. He was the reader, appointed reader. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Now that's really cool. I mentioned this briefly last week. We really don't know how good we have it have books. They did not have books. They had parchment. They had scrolls. This might have been. But a big scroll with the whole prophet Isaiah on there, that was a big thing. And then what happened was shortly after that, you had what's called a codex. The codex was actually a bound volume, which was a really important and big deal. And the Gospels became bound volumes. The, they didn't have Bibles. I mean, they had the Old Testament. But the New Testament was just, you know, Paul's epistles being carried around, and the Gospels, which usually, I think these books usually went around in tandem with other books of the New Testament, what we call the New Testament. But the false Gospels, in case you already ever watched this on the History Channel, History Channel or somewhere. What about the Gospel of Thomas? Have you ever heard about the Gospel of Thomas? Well, one of the ways we know it's bogus <laughs> is that it went floating around by itself. And the genuine readings of the Word of God never traveled by themselves, always in groups. Anyway, that's a little aside here. Pastor, yeah. I have just one comment that's okay. Sure. <laughs> When we were talking about Peter and he started talking and, and witnessing to people, I'm not that good with words and telling about Christ and that, but I really think it's sometimes how you live your daily life. Absolutely. Luckily, you're not a preacher. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. And that's I'm not, not your job, <laughs> not your duty. What's your duty? To be a mother, a wife, a neighbor, love your neighbor. Be kind, be merciful, that's your duty. So, those of you who have told you you're going to go and preach to everybody, give me a break. That messes things up. You can invite your neighbors to church by all means. But uh, you're absolutely right. Yep. So now, um, where am I? Preach more about right, how you live. Right. And, uh, but that's not preaching. Well, right? you can even um, show the gospel of Christ's love. Sometimes. I don't like to say preaching about Oh, we're back in Luke 4. Right. That's what we're doing. So he there was delivered to him the book. He found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me, here it is, this was in Isaiah, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of the sight of blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and again, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Close the book. Gave it to the minister, the servant, and he sat down. And
And the eyes of them all that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now that, if ever there was a mouthful, that's it. He's saying, that's, I am what this is about. I am here to preach. Finally, the day has arrived. But I pre preached the acceptable year of the Lord. Hear it now today. So he opens his mouth and speaks. And ever since then, what he did was, he sent forth apostles. Because he, of course, was going to die and rise again. And in those 40 days, appeared to his disciples and breathe on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And he sent them forth to preach. And then he ascended into heaven. Now look at Acts chapter 1 very quickly. And then we'll quit. Acts chapter 1 is the Acts of the Apostles, right? But, look at verse 1, Acts 1 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began. See that? Began both to do and teach until the day he was taken up. If you begin, if it's about something you began, the implication is that he's not done yet. And of course, that means that the acts of the apostles in the early church are in fact the acts of Jesus. And all the way till the end of the world, the acts of the preachers of the gospel are the acts of Jesus. That's why, going back to the third commandment, We should not despise preaching and his word, the holy sake. The preaching of the gospel is a sacred thing. It doesn't say the Bible is a sacred thing, even though it is, obviously. Right? You think, well, we should, we should love his word. Yeah, that's about his word. Take your Bible off the shelf and start reading. That's not what it says. Even though you should do that, good for you. The Word of God is meant to be preached, and we are meant to listen to the preaching of the gospel. All right. Got to run. Let us pray. O God, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life which thou hast given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Thank you. I have one, a mask at um, the one should have the...